Um, good morning. This is Friday, uh, January 8th, and this is the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. We have um, two witnesses this morning, Sarah Phillips and Jeffrey Pippinger from the administration. They will, they will introduce themselves. We, are, we asked them to come in this morning to um, begin, not only begin our work for the year, but to begin uh, a recap of what happened in 2020 with respect to homelessness um, to, to review quite quickly uh, when we went into lockdown and left the building in, Mar in the middle of March and then we, we had a, a full state lockdown soon thereafter. One of the first things that happened was that we um, got homeless families and individuals or households as we call them now um, off the streets and we uh, depopulated the shelters that we had going. It was still during the cold weather exemption. Um, and we found places for them to stay through the hotel system that we have. And then we used the CRF money to try to create safe spaces for the homeless. We'll hear more about that this afternoon from VHCB and others. Um, but I wanted to get uh, us up to date as best we can uh, on what the situation is. We're in the middle of the cold weather exemption time. Um, we have done what we all considered last year the right thing to do was to keep people who we expected to be high. Um, I forget what the word was and we can, Sarah or Jeffrey can get it, but basically hyper vulnerable uh, individuals that may have been vectors that we were concerned about their health and the, and the fact that they were vectors and could have spread it elsewhere. Um, the COVID if they, re if they received it. So I, I think that's as basic as I'm going to get. Sarah has been working probably 160 hours a week on this and deserves all of our, um, our respect for the amount of work that she and the division has done over this on this issue. It's been truly remarkable. Uh, the response of the state and the service providers that we have um, uh, that have been doing this for years and years and years with so Sarah and just from the beginning, thank you for your work and um, please I'm just going to pass the microphone to you. As you know, this year we are limited on time in our committees. I know you're limited for the day. Uh, so if we can just um, and I think you're here till 11 or up to 11 o'clock. You have to leave by then is, is what I've heard. Um, but uh, just welcome and please uh, kind of take us through what we did and, and, you know, kind of appreciate what we did as a success and, and the many miles to go that we still have to go in order to make sure that Vermonters stay safe. Thank you, Representative Stevens. Um, for the record, I'm Sarah Phillips. I'm the director at the Office of Economic Opportunity, which is a part of the uh, Department for Children and Families and the Agency of Human Services. And I'll let my colleague introduce himself before we get started. Good morning. Thanks for having us here. Thanks for having us here. For the record, my name is Jeffrey Pillinger. I'm Jeffrey a senior Pillinger. advisor to senior the commissioner advisor for the Department for Children and Families. Children and Families. And it's probably yeah, worth it probably in, this worth in this context to um, let folks know, for those of you who uh, do not know me, um, that prior to my current role, I was the General and Emergency Assistance Program Director for the Economic Services Division of the department, uh, meaning that among other things, I oversaw the motel voucher program. It's a pleasure to be here at this point. Thanks for having us. Great, and thank you. And, um, thank you. And, um, Sarah, do you need Sarah, to you need share to the screen? Share the screen. Oh, yes, I can share the screen. I apologize. I thought Ron would share the screen. He has the. We did create some slides to show you because we wanted to include some data. If that's me, you'll just have to give me one. No, I can I share. Can well, I can yeah. share. Well, yeah. No, actually, I can't. No, actually, I can't. I'll make you co-host. Are, Are you hearing a background sound? Are you hearing a background sound? That's off of Sarah. There we go. I apologize. Okay. I have okay. had to call in. Um, it's supposed to be linked, but I, if you hear it when I speak or only others? Only others. Only others. I, okay, I I'll be sure you. to. I hear you. And then I hear me speak. And then I hear me speak. 
I will be sure to mute myself when I'm not speaking, and that should help with that. I apologize. Um, as many Vermonters experience, including probably some of yourselves, I have bandwidth issues, and so calling in makes sure that I can participate fully in the meeting. Um, so I, I co do. You've been made co host. Okay. You're making me co host? Okay, so one moment, and I. Let me know, Representative Stevens, if you prefer for me to do it. Sarah, are you okay to um, share, or do you want Ron to do it? There you go. And now we need you to mute, unmute. Folks are seeing that okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, so, right. So thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And, um, and thank you for the partnership and the work with uh, this committee. Uh, during the past year. It has been a lot of work on behalf of many Vermonters uh, to address this issue in particular. Um, and, uh, and, and our community partners have really been, the go been amazing um, agencies to work with during this time. So um, this morning we're going to walk you through um, some uh, information about where we're at right now, how that maybe compares to past years. We know there's some new members on the committee and we want to make sure you have that comparison. Um, talk a little bit about the efforts not just to keep people safely housed but then uh, to rehouse folks experiencing homelessness, where we're at right now with that and, and what we see moving forward. So I actually can be here this morning until 1130 as needed. I don't know that we'll need that much time. I just wanted to make you aware of that I, I was able to do that. So, okay, let's see if I can... So to, to begin, we just want to make sure that when we say we're talking about who's homeless in Vermont, uh, we all have an understanding of what we mean. So uh, we use a definition of homelessness in Vermont that is used by, um, by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and it's a um, definition adopted by AHS and used across many programs. And generally, when we're referring to who is homeless in Vermont, we're talking about uh, folks that we might say are literally homeless, which is... Um, uh, folks who are unsheltered, folks who are staying in emergency shelter or in emergency housing are considered homeless, folks staying in a motel room paid for by a community partner or paid for by a charitable organization or paid for by the state, all of that is considered who's, who we're talking about when we're talking about who's homeless. Now, obviously, there are an awful lot of Vermonters who are also, um, you know, on the on the edge and, uh, and experiencing housing instability and precariously housed. And and we see the impact of that when you look at the numbers uh, later today. But, but this is who we're talking about when we usually uh, mean who's homeless in Vermont, and this is who the point in time count focuses on. So uh, many of you have heard me explain this before, but in Vermont we essentially have a system of care uh, that meets our emergency housing and our emergency shelter needs in two ways, right? We have our general assistance emergency housing program, that's the motel voucher program or temp housing, um, and then we have uh, the other half of the system of care, which is really our emergency shelter network, um, and that's made up of uh, projects that are operated by a number of community partners around the state, um, and we meet those needs in a variety of different projects. So some of that is through congregate emergency shelters, some of it's domestic violence shelters, some of it's seasonal shelters, some of it's emergency apartments for families. Um, so there's a range of ways that, and some of it's motel rooms paid for, again, by our community partners. So there's a range of ways that our community partners meet emergency housing needs. In a typical year, our general assistance uh, motel voucher program might serve about 2,500 households, and our emergency shelter, community-based emergency shelter network, serves about 2,700 households. So, so in a typical year, that's what we might see. Um, but as uh, Representative Stevens started to outline, uh, we very quickly realized that we were going to need to ex use this tool that we have, the Motel Voucher Program, and expand its use to, to meet a, a broader need. Um, 
and what, uh, what FEMA calls non-congregate shelter. So you'll hear me use that term, uh, but we have expanded the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program to meet a very, uh, to meet a non-congregate shelter need to, during COVID, right, during the pandemic. Um, and we did that um, by, by, using, by um, uh, waiving and variance of rules. And so I provided you that link if folks wanted to see sort of what the eligibility is, wanted to give, dig a little deeper there. So that's one thing we did. The other piece that folks should understand is that right now our emergency shelter network looks like 30 different emergency shelters uh, and 24 emergency apartments and then motel overflow that some of our domestic violence shelters actually, if their shelter is full, uh, rather than refer someone to the general assistance program, they just provide that motel room directly. That's what I mean when I say they have a motel overflow pool. Um, and our capacity in that emergency shelter network right now is about 350 households. So that's how many folks we can serve in that community-based network. And it typically operates uh, at, at its maximum capacity. Um, and that's because uh, we, these two systems of care work together, right? So if there's a shelter bed that's available and appropriate and safe for you, then that's where you're referred to first before you are, before you receive a motel voucher. Um, and then uh, just to say last year at the same time, just to put it in comparison, we had uh, capacity for about 560 uh, households. Uh, so our capacity in our shelter network's gone down significantly, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but also uh, it's gone up from where it was. So I also provided you the number that last summer we saw our capacity at about 160 households, right? So uh, when, uh, when the pandemic began, uh, a lot of our season, it was the end of the cold weather season, we saw some of our seasonal shelters close early. Uh, we saw some of them close because they rely on volunteers, sometimes older volunteers, um, or they just weren't able to meet the public health guidelines around social distancing effectively, or because they weren't able to provide 24-7 shelter, right? A lot of us shelters aren't, don't operate 24-7. It became really important that we be able to provide people safe places to be 24-7. So some of them closed and we lost capacity that way. Other shelters stopped accepting new guests. Um, and then, as Representative Stevens explained, some, uh, some shelters decreased their capacity and we placed those individuals in motels instead. So we saw our, our diminished capacity in the emergency shelter network, and then uh, we saw we've been slowly sort of reinforcing that network and we've seen our capacity increase, but we're not back up to where we would usually be this time of year. I'll pause because I see questions. Representative Tran. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Sarah. It's good to see you again. Um, if my memory, memory serves me correctly, we have uh, we had appropriated um, uh, certain funds to renovate congregate shelters in order to comply with CDC. I'm not sure that I'm seeing or hearing that, or unless it's coming later in your presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I will talk, yes, that's right. So through uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, some of their funds were specifically to help shelters renovate so they could better meet the public health guidelines. And that is why you see some of the capacity coming back online uh, for sure. So that, that work did happen. I know they'll, they'll talk more in detail about it with you, but yes, that's been an important part of how we've reinforced that shelter network. Great, thank you. Representative Walls. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Maybe you've got this coming in another slide. But I'm wondering how many individuals those households represent. Yes, I, I do have more data to share with you, so I'll, I'll keep going and hopefully okay. answer a lot of those. Okay, thank you. I'll hold off on that then. And Representative Clanky. Thank you. And Sarah, thank you and your team for everything you've done over the past nine months. It's really been profound to see how you stepped up. So appreciate it. One thing I'm, uh, I, I've been working uh, with recovery homes and it's been really helpful that you've been able to waive for the motel voucher program, some of the um, uh, variances of rules because the dilemma for people in recovery homes is recurrence happens of course in recovery and then, but you have to be taken out of the recovery home 
if, if you're using again. And right now they're able to use motel vouchers, but is it my understanding correct that if you cause your own homelessness, you do not qualify for motel voucher. And so if someone is kicked out of a recovery home, they can't go into a motel. Did I, did I get that correctly? Yeah. So, let me back up and say uh, just a couple of things. One is that the Office of Economic Opportunity administers uh, the side of the system that is the community-based system of care, right, the Emergency Shelter Network. It's my colleagues at the Economic Services Division that are really the subject matter experts in the eligibility around the general assistance program. So I want to be cautious in answering your question. I might defer to Jeffrey Pivinger, who used to be that uh, program director who can speak more specifically, but I, um, I think generally, yes, you're correct that the program rules have varied, um, and typically if you are uh, responsible for causing your own homelessness, that you would not be eligible under, under normal rules, not under the rules that we are operating with now. Right. Jeffrey, did you want to add anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Great. And so I do think, you know, I um, certainly Deputy Commissioner Trish Tile from the Department for Children and Families, um, she oversees the Economic Services Division and is really their team that does the, um, the benefits, uh, the general assistance eligibility, and, and they can speak more specifically to some of those questions. Thank you. So I'll keep going here. Um, so how many people are experiencing homelessness in Vermont right now? Uh, so anecdotally, at least we know that the number of Vermonters that are unsheltered or living in what you sometimes hear referred to as a place not meant for human habitation, right, the number of Vermonters that are unsheltered is way down right now because we have uh, opened the door wide open in the emergency housing program, um, and so that's been good news. Um, we know that there's a lot, there are sometimes individuals that don't, um, don't, uh, want to uh, receive a motel voucher from the Department for Children and Families, and there is some, some good outreach that our community partners do to sort of facilitate and, and uh, encourage people to have a warm place to stay, uh, which is important. So you might have heard about uh, in Montpelier an overflow shelter at Christchurch in Montpelier that Good Samaritan Haven operated during the month of December. Uh, they did that because they knew there were some folks who were unsheltered, um, and they opened those doors up, and they were able to serve a, fo a few folks. But their emphasis then was not on uh, maintaining that um, that church basement shelter, essentially. It's not in a basement, but in a church, like a big open fellowship room overflow shelter. Instead of maintaining that for the season, right, where they weren't able to offer 24-7 shelter, they used that as an, an opportunity for engagement and outreach uh, to help get folks connected and into a motel room where they can be safe and warm 24 hours a day. So, so a lot of effort has gone into um, to decreasing the unsheltered count. Uh, you know, I did sort of a little snapshot in time here for you, so I reached out to our domestic violence agencies that, that um, have their own motel, motel pool, and uh, uh, they had, uh, as of a couple nights ago, had 12 households in motels. Obviously, the largest number of folks who are homeless in the state of Vermont right now are in the motel voucher program. Uh, as of uh, January 6th, it looks like 1,800 rooms, about 1,827 rooms. Uh, you can roughly estimate that rooms as households is not exact, but uh, of those uh, 1,800 or so households, about 2,100 were adults and the remainder were children. And we're currently using uh, 78 different lodging establishments in the state of Vermont. So this is really an enormous number of folks that are in motels. Um, and then again, if you think about our emergency shelter network serving about uh, 350 uh, households in the state of Vermont. So, so this is really what homelessness looks in this, like in the state of Vermont right now. And Sarah, very, Sarah, um, very um, quickly, I suppose, on, on these rooms, um, what is the average cost of these rooms? Or are these, um, are these being negotiated separately between each, between each establishment? Um, I mean, because this will go into the discussion that we're going to have ongoing, which is, boy, when we create these things on our own or we work with the agencies like, like um, the, the Champlain Housing Trust, we're providing services along with this. These are just mostly 
the hotel room is for what costs on average? Yeah, so and I can follow up with more detail, but generally um, it's just a lodging establishment that agrees to accept payment through the program, right, a motel voucher. So there's no contract in place. Uh, and they uh, and, and the average cost per night, I think, across the whole program is about $88 per night per room. Um, there are a couple instances, for instance, as you mentioned, with the Champlain Housing Trust, where uh, the department has a contract with Champlain Housing Trust at Harbor Place in Shelburne. Um, and so that's essentially a nonprofit motel, and there's some on-site services there, and, uh, and that's obviously a much reduced cost. Uh, and then I would say we're also at this time, um, we do, we are leasing space, I think as folks are familiar at the Holiday Inn in South Burlington. Um, and so that's at a reduced cost as well and we have some staffing on site there. So, so generally, um, uh, I think the average is $88 per night, but I can follow up and get back to you uh, to confirm that that's still the case. Which is pretty much what, uh, pretty much what, what the program has what been. The program has been. It's, it's about the price that the program has been over the years. So um, I, I don't know that we need a specific price, so I, so I suppose that would help. But we are also, um, FEMA is picking up much of this cost, if I'm not mistaken, um, and we're paying a percentage. Is that still accurate? Yes. So uh, we, uh, FEMA is a reimbursement program, I think, as folks are familiar. Um, and we uh, have expanded the program, as I've said, to meet the non-congregate shelter needs due to the pandemic. Um, and so it's really an emergency response effort uh, due to, to meet a public health need. And so we continue to pursue uh, the avenue of FEMA funding. FEMA covers 75% of the cost, um, at, which is significant. Uh, and then the remainder has been uh, CRF funds, the coronavirus relief funds. Um, and I think, uh, that, so that, that is absolutely why we are able to do this. But it's also, again, I just want to drive and say the reason we're doing it is to meet a non-congregate shelter need due to the public health crisis. And that's important from a Pengo. FEMA. Yeah. Okay. So let me keep going. Um, um, do, I thought do, you this for, do you have time, time, for, time for a question? Do you have time for a question? Yeah. Representative Pengo. Thank you. It may be addressed later on in your slides. I see a little bit about it, but um, in terms of services at all of these locations, can you safely say that there are services for um, people who have been rehoused at all of these locations? And if so, are those costs not being picked up by FEMA or the CRF money? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we did, I, I, and we did early on um, expand services also to meet that surge need. Sometimes that uh, has been some housing, additional housing case management to help people identify housing and exit. Sometimes that's been just on-site services or outreach to motels to try and help people meet basic needs or really at, uh, to help meet uh, the safety and security needs at some of those sites as well. Uh, we certainly don't have on-site services at 78 different lodging establishments in the state of Vermont. And in many cases, I should be clear, these lodging establishments are housing folks that aren't in the general systems emergency housing program, right? Most of them are just operating uh, as, you know, as they would. So, so it's not as if, you know, General assistance clients are the only folks in these hotels, but in some cases we um, we do have on-site services, like I said at the Holiday Inn, where the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity is providing 24/7 staffing at that site, in part because it's a very large site and we have uh, leased the you know we have an arrangement for 100 plus rooms at that site. So um, we have uh, we did uh, use some of the appropriation from the legislature at DCF for homeless assistance to fund some of that increased housing case management and motel-based services through December uh, as of uh, when those um, grants ended at the end of December.
we have uh, we have pivoted a little bit to doing now what we're called non-congregate shelter services, uh, which we which we've structured to be FEMA eligible as well. Um, and so we do have we have entered into contracts with I think about 13 different providers around the state who responded to an RFP uh, to provide. Uh, on-site and motel outreach and on-site services. Um, again, we're not reaching every lodging establishment and we're not reaching every household and the level of services really varies from a site where you may have 24-7 staffing and support to a site where you have a team that's coming to do outreach once or twice a week. So, so there's a lot of variability there, but certainly everyone who is participating in the program has the opportunity to connect to um, to a service provider through what we call coordinated entry, which is how you get connected to housing help, uh, and to get access to housing resources to exit uh, exit the program. So, so that work is ongoing, um, and our community partners have really really picked up the effort in that. So. And one last question about that, and I'm sorry to keep asking questions, but how is that funded? Yeah, obviously it's going to be ongoing throughout this year. Was it part of your budget ask, or um, where where's that money coming from? Yes, it's in DCF's budget. Yeah, for for the you're talking about for the non congregate uh, wraparound services. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so I'll keep going. So this slide um, is just, again, OEO administers what's called the Housing Opportunity Grant Program, which is really the grant program that is the core funding for our, uh, our housing crisis uh, response system, right? Our emergency shelters, homeless prevention, and rehousing efforts. And, um, and so this, this graph, every year we do sort of an end of year report. You can find that on our website. I'm happy to share the link with Ron. Uh, but this graph is pulled from that, and it really shows in 2020 how, uh, you know, that end-of-year shift in capacity really impacted how many households we served in our community-based system of care. And then I think what's interesting is when you place that side by side with this chart, which is really looking at the motel utilization through the general assistance program, right? So you can see sort of the direct correlation in in March and April and May and June, where the emergency shelter network whoo, went down and we saw um, a huge increase in GA. I think this chart goes beyond that though in illustrating that we've continued to see an increased need. We did see a dip in the summer months, but we've seen it climb back up and we see now the highest number of households and motels that we've had over the course of the pandemic. Um, what's lost in this chart is that we've actually had a lot of households also exit motels, which you wouldn't catch in this, right? It's not the same households. So we've had households exit. We've had new households coming in, which are more over, overwhelming the system in some sense. Uh, but uh, again, really proud and glad that we're able to, uh, to do this as a state and ensure that every Vermonter has a safe place to stay right now. Uh, Representative Collins. Jeffrey, have to jump in right here and talk a little bit more. Oh, there was a question. Sorry. No, no I'm, I'm good. Said, thank no, you. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so this uh, slide gets us back into the motel voucher setting, uh, the non congregate shelter. Um, before getting into that, I just wanted to say, um, in response to Rep. Kalecki's um, question about the recovery settings, um, in a situation like that, a client um, would generally be seen not to have left that housing on their own accord. So that wouldn't be causing your own loss of housing. Um, really what it comes down to at this point is the, the situations are reviewed. And there's often a, a gray area or a case-by-case -case basis to determine that, which actually becomes really important in just a second. But uh, this is the, the snapshot of um, how many rooms uh, or households, uh, sometimes a household may take up more than one room, but that's infrequent. Uh, we're seeing currently um, households with children uh, as well as households without children. Um, Sarah, can you go to the next slide, please? So usually the way that we measure then count folks who experience homelessness from year to year to year to year is the HUD uh, point in time count which is a one-night census uh, of uh, folks experiencing homelessness. 
What I want to highlight in this particular moment, I won't read everything that's on there for you. You can see that. But what I want to highlight is that in 2020, so a year ago, uh, this is always in January, uh, 746 households, 1,110 people were counted as experiencing homelessness. If you, if, if you kind of think back to a few slides ago, what we're looking at now is 1,827 households and 2,512 people. Right. In some regard, I think what's important to remember, and we had talked about this during the summer during our testimony, is that oftentimes um, one of the one of the uh, critiques of the point in time count is that it's dependent upon the motel voucher system. The historical GA eligibility for the motel voucher system is based on categorical eligibility. Do you fit into these certain categories that determine whether or not you would be eligible? for a motel voucher through the state. On top of that, whether or not it was uh, an adverse weather night, a cold weather exception before that night, which is based on temperature metrics, right? Below 20 degrees, historically ambient or wind chill, or lower than 32 degrees for the greater than 50% chance of precipitation. Those things matter because if it was an adverse weather night, you'd see more folks in motels. So the, the, the data did kind of vary from year to year. I think what we have seen over the course of the pandemic is with those categories being stripped away due to our efforts to help during the public health emergency, you're really getting, a, uh, in some ways, we're getting a better sense of who's experiencing homelessness and who's precariously housed relative to the historic data. Um, Sarah, go ahead and... Okay, so back to you. Sorry, back to you. unmuted. Um, we just wanted to also, uh, you know, obviously expanding the general assistance program isn't the only thing that we've been doing. I talked a little bit about the expansion of services as well to meet that need. But we also um, have done a lot of work to reinforce our shelter network, a lot of guidance, um, opportunity for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with the Department of Health. It's facility-specific uh, training for staff. We've provided various supplies to our shelter network and also additional funding to just help fill the gap. So it's a, it's a stressful time for our shelter network. So when we say that they're operating at diminished capacity, in no way should f folks think that that means that they're doing less, they're doing much more at this point in time. Um, and then the other really important part of our, our response has been the establishment of isolation quarantine or recovery sites. And this is really for Vermonters who need to isolate or quarantine due to COVID-19 but they don't have a suitable home environment to do this. So sometimes that's because they're homeless or they're staying in a shelter or some other congregate setting. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a, a variety of factors that can mean somebody can't uh, stay where they are to isolate or quarantine. And so this has actually been a critical resource for us. Um, and uh, currently, uh, the Champlain Housing Trust, uh, our isolation quarantine site is operated by them at the Ho-Hum in South Burlington. The Ho-Hum was actually purchased with CRF dollars that BHCB was using, so um, was administering. Um, and so that'll be available to be an ongoing resource even once the pandemic is done. Um, and we do also have the ability to mobilize an additional 30 rooms if we needed. Uh, so that's, that's great news and that's an important resource in this work as well. Uh, and then, uh, importantly, uh, it's, uh, we've, we've really worked on uh, creating some resources to help folks exit motels uh, as quickly as possible into other safe housing options. Uh, so one of those initiatives that was part of uh, DCF's uh, work has been the rapid, what we call rapid resolution housing initiative. So this is really looking more, uh, more broadly than just even just permanent housing, like just exiting right into an apartment, but are there other safe housing options for you that would be better than staying in the motel, even if it's not permanent housing? Um, and, uh, and also to provide some flexible funding. So really having some client-centered, problem-solving, creative problem-solving conversations. Uh, and then having some resources available to make it happen. That's work that we're not always able to do in our system of care, honestly, because it requires some flexible funding. Um, and so this has been really a critical opportunity to build up our practice in this area as a field. Um, so that funding ended on at the end of December with the end of the sort of CRF one, so to speak. Uh, more than 200 households were assisted with that. And we'll have 
sort of as we're closing out that those uh, those grant programs will have better data at the end of the month. Um, but some examples of what folks were able to do, it's really the funds were able to be used to support any number of areas uh, where a household was experiencing barriers to housing. And so whether that be transportation costs or debt relief in some cases because the debt was preventing them from being able to uh, to afford housing in an ongoing way to pay rent and they had an apartment available but didn't have the, the income because of that debt. Uh, you know, move-in costs, is a, you think about what it costs to move into new housing. Uh, in some cases, it was help with security deposits. In some cases, it was help with uh, being able to um, to stay with family or friends, but covering some of those costs that might be associated with that. So this has been a really um, great opportunity for us to to broaden our um, just you know increase our toolbox, in other words. And so I think it's been an important tool. The other major initiative at DCF has been to focus on rental assistance to rehouse uh, households experiencing homelessness. And so. Uh, rapid rehousing is really the name of that kind of strategy. When we talk about temporary rental assistance um, and housing retention services that go with that, um, and, and in this case, that temporary rental assistance has been really 12 to 18 months of rental assistance. Um, folks exit a rapid rehousing initiative successfully because they're able to increase their income in that time to afford their rent in an ongoing way, or because they're able to bridge to like a permanent housing voucher. Um, and so we focused that effort uh, and prioritized in partnership with uh, the Vermont Continuums of Care, Homeless Continuums of Care, our, par our partners' networks. We focused that effort really on families um, and prioritized it for families such that most of those families in motels right now have a housing voucher and they're actively looking for housing. And so you can see some preliminary numbers right here. Um, there's kind of two projects that we did this with. One is Vermont Rental Subsidy. Uh, we focus, that's an, a project or a program that the department already administers um, that provides uh, 12 months of rental assistance. Uh, and we focus an expansion on that program really to, to serve uh, Vermont families that are in reach up, our TANF program. Uh, and so the Vermont rental subsidies uh, went to reach up families who were experiencing homelessness. Uh, and so we have 40 families that have already leased up with that and 52 families with vouchers that are looking for housing. And then the other larger project was the CARES Housing Project. So this is uh, um, funds that we, we used both CRF funds to um, on the front end of this project, and then we're using our uh, emergency, our HUD Emergency Solutions Grant CARES Award. Uh, so that's the HUD uh, funds that DCF receives annually, the Emergency Solutions Grant to support uh, um, the federal funds that are part of the Housing Opportunity Grant Program, we received a large CARES allocation, special CARES allocation to that program of $6.7 million. And so that's what we've looked to uh, to uh, create the CARES Housing Project. So that's a statewide project, CBOEO, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunities, our partner uh, administering the rental assistance. And then we have a number of agencies around the state providing uh, the housing retention services. So in that project right now, we have 270 house, five households who have uh, who have already been determined eligible and have housing vouchers and are searching for housing. Some of them will be housed or have been housed in the new units coming online through the work that the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has done. Um, and then 91 households have already been leased up. So, so that's great news. It's very exciting. And, and uh, part of the challenge, obviously, with doing rental assistance has been that um, the CRF funds were intended to end, we, you know, we were planning on those ending at the end of December. So, so the way, so the use of the ESG CARES money uh, allowed us to, to um, support this initiative, right? Because we looked, those funds had a longer spending period. Uh, and then with Vermont Rental Subsidy, what we had originally planned to do was uh, use our CRF funds to, uh, to supplement the general fund appropriation. So obviously now, uh, we'll be looking to see if some of the new rental assistance money coming from Treasury as part of the second relief bill will be one of the ways that we can support the, um, some of these initiatives moving forward. Great. Um, Representative Kalaki. Thank you. So, Sarah, for these numbers, uh, I know the rental subsidy on this slide, are the 52 families with vouchers and the 275 households with vouchers, are they waiting because there's not enough housing 
to move these families into, or are you hopeful that it's a, just a short-term issue? Like, what, what's, what's the holdup there? No, that's a great question. So um, it took us a little bit, just to be fair, it took us a little time to be able to launch these programs. So the CARES Housing Project and the VRS really launched, CARES Housing Project launched September 1st, and the VRS expansion really launched, I think, in August. Um, and the CARES Housing Project being totally new, so we had to sort of write it from scratch, right? Um, so so that's, part, that's part of it. And then from there, folks had to apply, be found eligible. Um, all of those households had gone through the eligibility process and received their voucher by December at the latest, most of them in October and November. It just took some time, um, September, October, November. Um, and then they have a certain number of days to find housing. Now, in a typical year, on average, and, and, and I, there's even been a report to the legislature on specialized housing vouchers in the past and, and some of the delays in utilizing those vouchers. And so out of that, we know that it, it and we know from other programs that on average it can take 60 to 90 days to find housing. It just does. The, our, our rental housing market is just that tight. Um, I think so. So some of the some of the delay is just due to that that normal time period of, of searching and finding housing, um, and then some of it honestly is uh, is that it, households with barriers to housing find it even harder to get into housing. Um, we also know that housing is not turning over like it might normally, uh, which is a good thing, right? We don't want uh, folks being evicted, but we're seeing sort of that housing turnover be even less than it might normally be. Um, and frankly, this is a lot of households looking for housing all at once. Um, this is not, this is a very large number compared to what we might normally see. Um, in an average year, Vermont rental subsidy is maybe 100 households. So, you know, in a short time period of just three to four months, we've essentially added 475 households. It's almost five times what we might do in a normal year. So, so I think we're seeing the impact of that as well. There's just going to be delays in leasing up. And by far, one of the greatest challenges we have is just people finding a unit. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Representative Blumley and then Byron. Uh, hi, Sarah. <clears throat> good to see you. Good to um, see you. Yeah, good to see uh, you. I, I am... I'm curious about, I've gotten a couple of um, emails from folks living in my district who have said, you know, ask me the question, will the rental subsidies continue? And I'm just wondering, how do I respond to them? So there's different kinds of rental subsidies, right? There's kinds that are designed to be temporary, uh, to only go on for 12 to 18 months, right? Like this initiative, it's a rental assistance subsidy or a rental voucher, but it's not a permanent voucher. Um, and by design, those programs, uh, what we would call the rapid rehousing strategy, um, is folks exit from that program successfully because they're able to increase their income and afford their rent in an ongoing way or because they bridge onto a permanent housing voucher. Um, so by design, um, this resource is not necessarily intended to be ongoing. I think there's also was the rental relief program or the rental housing stabilization program that the state housing authority administered, right? That was largely providing rental relief for people in current housing. Um, and I, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later on because that is the, the new money that Treasury is uh, the $200 million state minimum that, that we're getting in Vermont um, that is intended to really meet that need um, and some work is happening on, on how to quickly mobilize that. Um, and then, you know, that program though in the, the first version of it, and I think you have Richard Williams from the State Housing Authority here today, so I'm not going to go too into depth because I think he'll be the best one to talk about his, his program. Um, but, uh, but they did also have some funds available for people to move. They called it money to move. Um, we worked really closely to carve out what we were doing at DCF to be different than what the State Housing Authority was doing. And largely, our population was people experiencing homelessness, helping them get rehoused, whereas the population that the State Housing Authority was serving was people already in housing, right? So it was a little bit different um, in that sense. And so I think um, one of the things that we haven't seen uh, from the federal government is new permanent housing choice vouchers, right? We haven't seen the Section 8 vouchers, right, as they're commonly called, 
Um, and those are really important resource for us, um, particularly when we think on the, the other end of, of the rapid rehousing initiatives, right, is that we want people to be able to bridge to a permanent housing voucher if it's available. And we just know that our current number of housing choice vouchers in the state uh, and just the regular attrition in that program isn't going to be able to absorb 375 households a year from now. And so a lot of effort will happen in the next year to uh, to work on employment and income with the households in the program, and a lot of effort will be done to work with our, our local public housing authorities uh, as well to see if they can also uh, partner with us to create what's called a move-on preference, in other words, moving on from this program to that program, right? Um, and then I think uh, some advocacy at the federal level around um, housing choice vouchers is certainly something that's ongoing as well. Hopefully that answers your questions. It's probably more complicated than how you want to answer your neighbor, but. Yeah, I might need to yeah, circle I might back need with to you. circle back with you. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And I, and I think Representative Bloomley, I think there's a, there's a part of our work is going to be reviewing what we can do with the $200 million that, that the federal government has focused on it and because these programs that we approved this year all expired and so figuring out how to continue those resources or get this this money into the resources is is, a, is going to be a key part of our work in the next few weeks so um, which is different from the on as, as Sarah was saying is different from the 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 programs that already existed that were perhaps undercapitalized um, representative Byron and then Parsons Thank you. Um, so my question is a little bit about uh, uh, an associated impact of housing insecurity. And I was curious what your organization saw with um, uh, working with the food insecurity organizations, um, especially around the emergency housing hotel scenarios, the shelters, whatnot. Um, did you see success with you know, working with food bank, Meals on Wheels, uh, Everyone Eats is a newer thing. I'm just curious to get your feedback on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So first, let me say that part of what we're doing with the non-congregate sheltering is also ongoing meal delivery. And that was actually a critical thing that we needed to begin immediately because a lot of what folks experiencing homelessness rely on for food is our uh, community meal sites, right? And those all shut down. So. Uh, so our community partners first launched into meal delivery, delivery very rapidly and sort of redid their systems of, you know, their systems of care essentially, right? And so they went to delivering meals to motels and then we as a state were very quickly able to, to, um, to take that on and to issue some contracts. And so we, every single household that is in a motel through the GA program is also eligible for for meal delivery as well, um, and that work continues. And I, I don't have those numbers today, but I can follow up. Certainly, not everyone chooses to participate, but but that's but that's an important part of the food security work that's happened. And then I think, um, you know, I think also a lot of these agencies are also the agencies that are the primary agencies in their communities doing food security work, right? So I think of like um, Groundworks Collaborative in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, and they operate a year-round shelter there. They also typically operate um, a day shelter and a seasonal shelter. Uh, but since last spring, they have been providing 24-7 uh, services on-site at the Quality Inn in Brattleboro, where they uh, uh, serve a lot of households there. They also operate, um, I think, uh, the largest food shelf in, in that area as well. And so they're very connected in with the food security work uh, as well. And, and um, I can follow up with the numbers on the meal delivery, though, if folks would be interested in seeing those. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I um, worked a lot in getting the Everyone Eats program up and running and then helping sort of like it move through the pandemic. So um, I kind of dove a little deeper into the food security, insecurity dynamics. So I, I just wanted to get your feedback on that. So that's really warms me to hear that it's been it's been successful partnerships yes for sure i think that the everyone eats uh initiative has definitely reached um this population as well yeah and the partners have been working closely um i'll keep going Repres just to hold on sir we got one question on you on this on. one and Sorry. we'll go and then, well, then no no then we'll get to those next slides um representative parsons 
Yeah, thank you. Um, my question was uh, something I've heard from quite a few people actually. Is there any sort of tiered system to this approach at all? Um, one thing that I hear a lot is you, you when you make enough to be off the program, you, you're in that flux of now losing those funds from um, from the program to help with the rent or something. Now you lose those funds, you're kind of back in the exact same spot you just were. Um, so instead of, I mean, I understand going from temporary to a voucher, a more permanent voucher for um, assistance for housing. Um, is there a, a more tiered approach so that as you do make more, it slowly decreases? Or is it kind of that cliff edge where you lose the voucher, now you're right back to where you were struggling just to get by to pay the rent? Can you unmute, sir? Yeah, unmute. I was muted. Unmute. It didn't work. Sorry about that. So in our rental assistance program, folks contribute uh, about 30% of their income towards their housing costs, right? Um, and so as your income increases, you do contribute more, but it's the same percentage. Um, and uh, the, that's the way that, um, if I go back, that's the way that that's the way that a lot of our um, permanent housing rental assistance programs are structured. It's, it's how the housing choice voucher, the Section 8 program is also structured. You contribute 30% of your income. So the Vermont Rental Subsidy and the CARES Housing Project are both in that way. In some ways, that, that definitely like eliminates the, the cliff, right? So um, your, your income is increasing, but not every dollar, only 30% of that next dollar is going towards your housing costs. Um, that's, that's the most general answer there. I think as opposed to other public benefit programs where there may be a greater cliff, I think generally in our, in our housing programs, um, that's largely abated. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure if, if that was, okay, great. Um, so just to say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of other work, and I, I think um, Representative Kalaki alluded to, and others were asked about the VHCB and, uh, piece of this. So obviously, we needed new units also, um, and uh, the rental rehabilitation program that the Department of Housing and Community Development has implemented with the Home Ownership Center. So this is where there's been funds available for landlords to renovate their uh, empty units that may be off the market, right? to bring them up to code and then to, ha to use those units to house homeless uh, Vermonters. And so that's been a really great initiative to launch um, and uh, an important piece of this work. And we've, we've coordinated closely with them on that and on our community partners as well. Um, and then new permanent housing units that the VHCB was able to create in, in partnership with the uh, affordable housing network as well. Uh, and those funds also went to create new and improved shelters. So uh, we did actually have a, a new place and steps in Burlington. Uh, both have new facilities, uh, which is great um, and, uh, and meets a, a long-term need in some ways for a permanent home for the, for the seasonal warming shelter, um, which is now year-round, uh, and then also for the steps to domestic violence shelter, which just never has had enough capacity. So. So those are some new projects that came online through through that work, um, and then uh, and then I, we talked about the state housing authority. So just to say uh, that there's been really an incredible amount of collaboration and coordination with our state partners around these initiatives to really try and uh, braid them together more so than uh, you know we always work together, but in this moment in time more so. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about some successes and challenges as we're thinking about sort of what we're doing next, right? Because um, we have a lot to be proud of um, and feel really good. And obviously, uh, we're not done yet. And so the work continues. Um, one of the things that I think we've really learned is that on-site uh, motel-based services really matters. And that's something that we have, I think, never done. Uh, with the exception of uh, granting funds to our domestic violence shelters who then 
again, do their own motel overflow. They provide services to those households, but, uh, but the expansion of our motel-based services has really been, uh, really been good. Um, the amount of local collaboration and coordination is just really incredible with uh, leaders coming together weekly on the phone uh, and in different meetings to, to uh, respond to, and, uh, to different situations, but also to sort of proactively uh, move forward in different strategies. Um, the work that our community partners have, have, have picked up and really leaned into this crisis is really incredible in our, in our housing world. Um, the statewide collaboration coordination, I, even before this testimony this morning, had a call with our statewide partners. I mean, that, that's ongoing work that we are doing. And then I would just say uh, there's been a really major increase in housing retention services and also in, in rental assistance. Um, and, and it's been an incredible opportunity, I, I think, to, to think that we could really, um, really make a dent in family homelessness in this state in a big way. Um, so all that's to say, what we're, what we're doing is in particular with non-congregate sheltering in motels is, um, is truly unsustainable for us, 1,800 households in motels. It's, it's unsustainable for those households, let me just say that, living in a motel long-term um, it just is unsustainable for those families and individuals. I think it's also pretty unsustainable for our communities, and it's definitely unsustainable for our community partners as well, uh, not to mention financially really unsustainable for us um, in the long term. So, uh, you know, our biggest challenge is lack of housing. Um, that is number one challenge that, that we're experiencing. Um, and then I think another challenge for us, and this is really ongoing work, is how we braid together those different resources. It takes a lot of effort. Um, you know, we talk about our three-legged stool of unit or capital of rental assistance and of services, and for us to be successful, all three of those need to braid together. Um, and so that takes a lot of work to do that effectively. It needs to braid together at the systems level, but when it doesn't at the systems level, think about the effort it takes to braid it together for each individual household and family one at a time to make it happen. So that's, that's a, a huge amount of work. It's, um, it's something that we're continually working together on how we could better integrate these systems of care to just be more effective and just to be able to be more streamlined and move faster. So looking forward, it's come up probably, I don't know, a half dozen times already in this testimony, but there's $200 million in for emergency rental assistance. Um, I think it's really important that we move really fast to, to mobilize those funds. Um, there, there is some prescription around them coming from the Treasury, um, and uh, they can really around rental arrears, utility arrears, utility assistance, and rental assistance ongoing. Um, there's some eligibility criteria that's different than what we had been doing with uh, the State Housing Authorities Program, um, but there's a huge opportunity there. Some of the funds can be used for administration, and some of the funds can be used for housing, housing supports as well. So we're working really, really closely with the Department of Housing and Community Development, um, uh, which we expect uh, will be a lead uh, in this work, and with the State Housing Authority to really quickly figure out how we're going to administer these funds and get them out the doors. And I would just ask, uh, I think that the legislature equally help us move quickly on that and that we don't want to spend a, a couple months uh, figuring out what we're going to do. We know. Uh, we know what we need, and, uh, and it's really about figuring out how we're going to administer it really quickly. Um, I think we, we learned a lot about the rapid resolution flex funds that I talked about and how critical that is, and so we're going to look to do a 2.0 on that. Uh, we did have some underspend in our CRF funds for homeless assistance for DCF, uh, in part because uh, for a number of different reasons, and so some of those funds I think we'll be able to, to look to to help us continue this work. Um, Jeffrey, I think you were going to talk a little bit about uh, the summit. Sure. So just very briefly, and I'm happy to talk more about this, but um, back in November, right before Thanksgiving, we brought together um, stakeholders from across the state, um, including uh, folks with lived experience, uh, providers, service providers, housing providers, there were legislators, president, policymakers, funders. Uh, because we thought it was important to have an opportunity to come together and talk about what had happened so far, even, even though we're still continuing to do the work, right? But a moment of reflection to see what have we learned so far, nine, ten months into this, that may or may not inform the way that we're moving forward. 
or uh, and an opportunity for folks to talk with each other and hear from each other. Uh, there were over 100 people on a Microsoft Teams meeting. It was kind of wild. Uh, and then we had where we had communities report out on their successes um, and takeaways and uh, ahas. And then we had small group discussion that cut across those geographic and uh, um, sectors. What was interesting that came out of that was just, in some ways it's unsurprising, but a uh, focus on the need for collaboration, how, how much that mattered uh, in communities uh, and bringing folks to the table who may not have been at the housing table before, but were critical partners, whether that be healthcare, whether it be private landlords, uh, whether it be uh, clients or whether it be other types of providers. The flexibility and creativity was really important as well to folks, uh, including uh, and the, the presence of those on-site services that Sarah talked about earlier. One of the biggest themes that emerged from that conversation was uh, housing as healthcare, and kind of the opposite as well, like healthcare as housing. It was just people, people were really um, looking at the ways in which a public health crisis may have shifted the conversations about housing and healthcare and the need for housing and the need for healthcare when you're in housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, was, it was an interesting lens to hear people talk about. I mentioned this also because we expect to and we intend to continue these sorts of conversations. I don't wanna check the box and say that was a great summit. See you all in 2022. Uh, instead, what we should be doing is going back to communities, back to folks, and then continuing to engage in those conversations, especially as we move forward, because that's a, just a critical part of how we transition from what we're doing now to what we're doing in the future. So just to kind of leave it, um, one kind of final piece that we just wanna make sure we mention today is that you know pre-COVID, we had a plan to end the general assistance emergency housing program and move uh, the funds and some support and uh, collaboration to our community partners so that they can really, that two-part system of care would really be a community-based system of care where DCF is partnering and funding it. Uh, that is still our intention in, in the next, uh, in say fiscal year 2022. Um, and so a lot of effort is happening right now to plan and think about how do we get from where we are now in this very large non-congregate shelter program that GA has become with 1,800 households. And what does it take to, what does it look like to phase out of that? Obviously in conjunction with the state of the pandemic, right? Because the whole reason we're doing it is to meet a public health need. Um, and the vaccination implementation is gonna be a huge piece of that. So what, is it, what does it look like to phase out of that and then phase towards a community-based system of care, which we absolutely are still committed to as a department and as an agency. And so being thoughtful about what that looks like, uh, working with our community partners and planning around that as well. Uh, so that's all a part of the work that we're also uh, starting to re-engage in at this point in time. So we just wanna make, make sure this committee is aware of that's still a policy priority for us. And Sarah, if I can end on, I had three quick points that I just wanted to, to make um, very precisely. One is that um, I think we've done incredible work. And I say we, I mean everybody. Not This isn't about the, the state capital S. We have done an incredible job during the pandemic with regard to keeping folks who are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity safe during the pandemic, safe and healthy. Having this many people in motels, having 2,500 people in motels is not ending homelessness. This is, this is a transitional thing, right? This is a holding tank because we're in a crisis. What we really need to do is be, keep our eyes on the fact that ending homelessness is about moving people into permanent housing. So I just wanna remind people about that. The second piece is, and Sarah touched on this when talking about the uh, related housing recovery initiatives. There's, that collaboration, that intentional collaboration is really important and keeping in mind the three legs of the school that we talk about, the rental assistance, the stock and the services. And then the final thing I wanted to mention was that um, just to continually contextualize that it's really easy to kind of get into the 
okay, people are in motels, we're getting them services, we're getting them rental assistance, just that sort of level of detail, when in reality, this is in the context of a public health crisis, right? What we have done is in response to that, not necessarily, you know, what, what we could have or should have or were planning to do prior to the pandemic. Um, I think we've done an incredible job and I think it's really informed a lot. Uh, we've learned a lot out of it. Uh, and I think that that will inform things going forward. But I just wanted to make those points as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Representative Hengo. Thank you. Um, one thing I was gonna ask about is the plan that Sarah just outlined um, that's going forward because that was a big, a big consideration um, a year and a half ago to move to community partners. And at the time I was a little bit skeptical maybe, but I really wanna give a shout out to those community partners and teams. Um, we have a local team in St. Albans called the Community Housing Response Team. They have been meeting three times a week um, and it's a group of professionals um, with people from DCF and OEO and, and the shelters. And they're, they're really working hard to make sure that every individual in Franklin County who needs something is being taken care of. So I've been very, very impressed with the community response. And I just wanna give a shout out to Matt and the Everyone Eats program because food insecurity is really high on my list of priorities. And I have just seen people reap the benefits of these programs. Um, so, Yes, I do support people being able to get out of these congregate settings and into places where they can call home. Um, and I do believe now, especially having seen it in action, that the community partners and collaborators are really the ones to help move this forward. So um, thank you very much for all your efforts. I appreciate it. And yeah, thank you, Representative. I, oh, I, was, I was just going to Go say ahead. thank you. Go ahead. I think um, acknowledging that I, I, I have the privilege of sitting before you talking about this work in the state, but I don't do any of it. <laughs> they, they do it, and they do the hard, sacred work that, that is the day-to-day -day work with people and in communities, and it's, it's hard work, and it's good work, so thank you. And thank you, Jeffrey, for pointing out that this is, this is um, triage, basically. Um, what's happening with the motel units is triage, and it, it's definitely um, an in-between where we were and where we need to go. But, um, and again, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you are all still focused on the fact that this is a public health crisis and needs to be um, dealt with in that way. And a year ago or nine months ago, I was I expressed a concern or, or a hope that that as we collect the data that we'll be able to when, when things slow down that we'll be able to collect the data and do something that is and, and have that book or have that um, the necessary backup and research to continue to make the argument for permanent housing. And I'm just curious to know how do, is there someone does your does your um, department have the capacity to do the intake on the data and and try to work on on what an output would be? I guess Jeffrey, that's for you. I think what you're asking is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Stevens, but what, part of what you're asking is, you know, are we able to have more detailed information on the number of people who are currently in motels that can inform policy going forward, knowing who's there and why? And then the second part of that is, what then could help? What is the intervention that would help that situation? If that's the question that's being asked, then I would say that, uh, you know, part of, um, what is remarkable, one of the remarkable, one of the many remarkable things about what has been going on is that, you know, we have been doing, um, let me check that. Our community partners have been doing enormous work um, getting folks into coordinated entry and collecting you know, information and prioritizing folks, understanding who's in the motels and, 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 and putting them on the master list in their, in their 
local communities. And I think that that diving into that data is, I think that that's the piece that you're asking about. You know, what is, what is now that we have all these folks in motels and they're in coordinated entry, what is that telling us about um, uh, why people are there and who's there? And I think, the, you know, the short answer is like, it's complicated. There are a lot of people in for various reasons. But I do think you're right. I think we need to continue to look at that going forward and help that and, and dive into it more deeply. I don't know if Sarah wants to add anything to that, but. Sure, I would just say, I mean, for those of you who are new on the committee, coordinated entry is just this term that we use in our system of care to refer to um, the way that we all agree that we, um, that people access uh, homeless, how homeless resources, homeless housing resources, um, not emergency shelter, emergency housing. Obviously, that needs to be different, but it involves sort of a uniform assessment, and partners have specific roles to play, and uh, folks complete the assessment. They're placed on what's called a community-wide master list, and that is the list of who's homeless in your community. And then community partners come together, and they understand how we have a better understanding at the community level and then at the statewide level who's homeless and what their housing needs and resources are. And then that helps us plan strategically around what we need because it's not enough to say we need more housing. It's what kind of housing do we need? It's what kind of services do we need? Who needs long-term support services? Who needs just a little bit of help? And the differences in that. So we actually know a lot about what the solutions are to end homelessness. It's really about at what scale do we need each of those different kinds of tools in our toolbox. And coordinated entry is part of the way that we get that information. And importantly, it's the way that individuals and families are connected to housing help. So participating in coordinated entry gets them connected to what we call a housing navigator who helps them navigate the wide array of housing programs that are out there uh, and helps them uh, find and find housing. So that, that's coordinated entry is sort of the short form for that. Great. Thank you. Representative Kalenki. Thank you. And, you know, Sarah and Jeffrey, I, I so appreciate the presentation, but as you both talked about how the uh, community has collaborated, I, for me as a first time legislator last spring and the summer, I also saw that this caused the House and the Senate to act differently and the different committees, we were less siloed. Suddenly we were working alongside human services and our chair was working with Sorokin in the Senate and we all worked together with the administration. And you, know, you, you talked about, you were sorry it took so long. Well. This just happened since March. And you know, we put together this $85 million package in about three weeks time. But, but I think what's important, the lesson there is we can act differently in the House and the Senate as well. And we don't have to dismantle each other's work and we can work collaboratively with the administration. So as we look to move this 200 million or whatever we have for this part of it, I think the same thing will happen again and we will all work uh, now, this is only my second term, so maybe it uh, existed in the past, but it was new behavior for me and I, I applaud it very much and I appreciate it. So thank you. And, and, and to that, John, I would say, you know, Representative Kalecki, I would just say that so often, I mean, what we did was a response to a public health crisis, period. And we were given funds and the funds were presented in a way to address a need. And that's a, that's a, it, it, without that public health crisis, we would have had a completely different conversation last year about um, trying to end homelessness or trying to help alleviate or, or create new housing. And so on the one hand, what we saw was a budgeting process in this case that was based on need and there were funds available to do it as opposed to what we see with the normal budget in the state, which is to be based on a number where we have a certain amount of money that we have to fit everything into. Um, so that is, which is a fundamentally different way of looking at how to address, you know, are you looking at the need or the number? And so we were able to do this in a way I think that is special. It is something that hasn't happened before. It's nothing I've ever experienced here. Um, question um, for Sarah and Jeffrey, the, the idea that, so we're talking a lot about numbers here. We're talking about there's a certain number of people who needed assistance and they needed a place to stay and they needed to be safe. And, and 
now we're in transition and this number of people will hopefully will find units for them to live in. Um, but it's not addressing so much what it was like on the ground in those places to go from, I mean, being experiencing homelessness is not anything anyone really chooses. Um, there may be a very small percentage of people who feel like they, they, they can't. There's also uh, mental health issues or physical health issues that play into homelessness. There's economic issues. Um, there's some demographic issues that play into this. And yet, um, so are, are you the folks that we should talk to about what happened at the motel or the hotel in Morrisville or in Montpelier, you know, in terms of the management of what happened? I mean, it's, again, it's being in a homeless shelter is, is not an easy existence. Those shelters went away. They went to, to hotel rooms. How did people react? Um, did people have isolation problems? Were there um, cultural problems within the hotel? Were there little, um, it, 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 that's a broader, I guess it's a broader social question. It gets away from just the, the data that you've presented. Um, are you the folks that we should ask about that? Or is that, should we be talking to our community partners who can give us feedback on that? Us feedback on that? Yes, I think, um, right, you can imagine what it would be like to be a family with children trying to remote school your kids in a hotel room that you all share. Um, you can certainly imagine what it feels like to, maybe you can imagine what it feels like to live without uh, a kitchen uh, or even a refrigerator or microwave and rely on meal delivery where you're not really choosing your meals in any way. So I, I think there's definitely a humanitarian aspect to this, a social aspect to this, as you said, Representative Stevens, that I think is worth deeply understanding. And I do think that your best um, folks to tell, help tell that story would be uh, some of our community partners that have been really close to this work. And, um, and I would say that, um, you know, I'm happy to help identify uh, some of those agencies that I think would be great to provide some testimony to your committee if you're interested in hearing more. Um, I think certainly social isolation is a huge piece, right? That's a huge piece across all of our uh, community, all of our state, and certainly for folks experiencing homelessness as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's interesting to think around how, how, did, how did folks find themselves in a hotel room during the pandemic, right? And to try and understand that story a little bit, uh, especially during an eviction moratorium, right? It, it leads you to understand that while uh, eviction prevention is an important part of homelessness prevention, that a, a lot of people come into homelessness not from losing their own permanent housing, right? They come into homelessness because they're pushed out of housing situations due to violence or due to other issues where they might be doubled up with, with other households, and I think, or because they're unsheltered, but, but, but that's not the, you know, these, these folks weren't all coming from the streets into the GA program, right? They just weren't. And we didn't have that level of unsheltered homelessness. So trying to understand like, where people are coming from and how they enter homelessness is, is, is I think, really important work. And um, certainly not everyone will exit the uh, GA program into permanent housing. Some of them, I hope, will be able to return with to living with family or friends, potentially with some support around mediation or um, additional financial resources. Um, we've already seen that happen, and I think that's an important piece of what we need to do moving forward. It's about safe exits, and and um, and just because someone is no longer in a motel doesn't mean that they aren't still connected with housing help to find other permanent housing, right? So. It's a complicated story uh, for each household and certainly as a system of care as well. Um, so I encourage you to invite some of those partners and to hear from them on what it's like uh, in the motels. I would also add on, if I may, add on, that, um, I think what Sarah's talking about is really important because oftentimes we, um, we work really hard to get quantitative data, right? And something that should go along with quantitative data is qualitative data. You know, what are the narratives that go along with those numbers? What, what are the people, what are the experiences that people have? Um, and, and part of that is what Sarah's talking about, how, how might someone find themselves in a motel and how might someone find themselves in a motel? What's their experience while there you know, as, you know, in terms of social isolation, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that came, one of the pieces of feedback we received regarding that statewide summit was that the folks who were in a small breakout group that had somebody with lived experience in it 
had um, uh, remarked about the power of that conversation. So I might also offer that in addition to our community partners, um, that folks with lived experience might be a valuable voice to, to hear from. And I'm sure our community partners can help identify some folks who could speak to that. And I think, um, I mean, last one, last question for me anyway, for today, just on a, on a data perspective, we talked a lot of last year about what the percentages of homelessness or, or individuals, households uh, experiencing homelessness are. There's X percent who are, um, I forget what the classifications were that we had, but we had sort of a, a, a short-term, medium-term, and long-term, essentially is what the breakdowns, you may have used a different vocabulary. Um, could you just give us that as a, as a data point so that when we, again, when we tr try to take in this whole picture of, of who is experiencing homelessness in the state of Vermont, there are definitely different, um, among the complexities, there's just that you've broken it down into into short, medium, and long. Can you explain those a little bit? Yeah, I think so. And that that is not maybe not the most beautiful language, but that is what we talk about: short, medium, and long. So it's really about thinking about in terms of what's the housing intervention, uh, right? So if someone's experiencing homelessness. What's the housing intervention that's going to help that household? And and generally, it kind of falls into those three buckets where. Short term is really focused on, you know, one time or maybe a couple months of assistance, whether it's rental assistance or services, helping get people connected. Like some people really just need a little short term assistance and they're going to be okay. Um, and then what we might call like medium term is really up to like two years of rental assistance, right? I talked about the rapid rehousing strategies of the CARES Housing Project and Vermont Rental Subsidy. Those are medium term pro interventions, housing interventions. Um, and those are really, you know, rental assistance that's temporary um, and some housing services that are really individualized based on the household. Like what, what services does that household need to be successful? And then, um, and then there's what we call long-term, which is sometimes called permanent supported housing, right? That's, that's really more the term of art is permanent supported housing, which is long-term uh, affordable housing paired with long-term permanent supportive services to help that household maintain independence. And so these are households typically who may have been for for in in our world of homelessness, we prioritize households that are chronically homeless for permanent supported housing, right? These are households that have a disability that affects their ability to live independently and they've been homeless uh, a number of uh, months or years. And so um, or in the family world, we have family supportive housing, which you all helped us expand actually this year. I haven't talked about that at all, but that's been exciting to expand family supportive housing. And that's, again, it's long-term support services to help families with complex uh, service needs, multiple episodes of ha homelessness in their history, um, families with child welfare involvement, um, and to help and young kids and to help rehouse them and then provide long-term support services to help them keep their housing. And all of that's with an eye towards understanding this, what we call housing first principle or philosophy, right, which is when people have housing stability, it's so much easier to work on everything else that's going on in your life. It's just such a fundamental piece of what makes us able to, to move forward in, in life, right, is to be stably housed. And so um, so family supportive housing and permanent house supportive housing or what's sometimes shelter plus care is another example of a long-term program. So we have these buckets of short, medium, and long-term, right? And uh, you know, how many households need short, medium, or long-term is one of the things that we look to coordinated entry for, right? Because that is some of the information we gather helps us understand that. So I, I can't sort of off the cuff say this percentage needs X, Y, or Z, but what we, what we can dig into is understanding from the coordinated entry data, which tells us who's homeless right now, uh, what does it look like? And I think that's re really critical um, because it helps communities plan and target and understand what are exactly the gaps that we have in our system of care here and what do we need. We have gaps across the board, obviously. We have gaps uh, generally in our system of care, right? Right now we have a whole lot of money coming into our system of care, and so and we have a whole lot of increased need as well. Um, and uh, and I, I think we've largely been able to fill a lot of those gaps, not all of them, because the money hasn't been able to be um, – uh, to, to fill all of those gaps. So, for instance, permanent supported housing, right? We don't have new long-term housing vouchers and we don't have new long-term supportive services. 
Um, but uh, we're working to, to braid in what we do have with some of those other uh, some of those other uh, programs that we have, and to leverage what we have already in our system of care better. So. I don't know if that kind of answered what you were asking, Representative Stephen. Certainly, could come back at a future uh, at a future meeting to bring more of that coordinated injury data to this team as well. Yeah, that would be helpful eventually. I just think, I think it I think it illustrates how there's no one simple vocabulary um, for any of this um, material. So, any further questions for for Jeffrey or or for Sarah for today? Um, you're our initial witnesses of the year, so thank you. Um, and uh, I think I think you know, being respective of your time, it's 11:27. So um, I just and and for our time too, I mean, it's a long time on to be on Zoom first day. So um, I guess we'll we'll let you two leave, and then committee, if you can stay on for just a few more minutes, Ron, you can keep us on live. Um, until we're done. And, um, but thank you so much for, for starting this off. I appreciate this. Um, and again, committee, um, if there's, if there's questions that you have of Jeffrey or Sarah, obviously you can reach them through their emails or via Ron can help make connections as well. So, um, um, and then the glory of having the dog, this, this slideshow is, is that it will always be in our records so we can return to it later. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Thank, Thank you very much. So much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right. And for new folks, um, I, the one thing I'll point, one of the things I'll point out is um, there's going to be a lot of vocabulary, um, a lot of lingo, a lot of different names of organizations or agencies. Um, I, I was happy to see that on the slide deck, um, Sarah did not re rely on acronyms. Um, so instead of saying um, the Agency of uh, Commerce and Community Development, she didn't rely on ACCD, which would, um, who knows what that is unless you can see it. So we will try to be, um, we will not achieve a totally lingo-free zone, but if you ever um, come across something that you don't understand and you feel like you need to get it in, and you can't get it in context, um, as long as we have the chat box open or you can just raise your hand and ask, um, I think uh, we can train our witnesses as well to um, catch themselves from, from using their shorthand, um, especially here at the beginning of the session. All right, any further questions for this morning? Um, I'm gonna go take a walk. I know that sitting is um, sitting is sitting. But I guess we'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much, and, and we'll see you. Um, I guess it's one fifteen or one thirty. Are we on next for her? Yes. Um, let me double check that. Sorry, you said you wanted to uh, stay for. You wanted me to stay for a few minutes afterwards. I need to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, and Representative Triana. If he's here, he's, I think he's at a PT thing, isn't he? Oh, right. He had to leave. Correct. Right. Um, so to answer your question, one thirty this afternoon. One thirty, because if people are interested, the, the tax presentation starts, I believe, at noon um, and goes to one fifteen. So make sure that you get something to eat and get a walk in or what have you. And we'll see you at one thirty, and we'll actually... And, and this afternoon's conversation will be with um, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, the Vermont um, State Housing Authority, who ran the rental rearage program, and the Vermont Housing Finance Organ um, Agency that did um, the mortgage rearage program. And so we'll get an idea of how we spent some of the $85 million that had been um, uh, allocated to homelessness um, mitigation in 2020.